So I think we have a clear understanding that not all the PV patients are the same and not that all the therapies work in all the patients. There is clearly a need for a new developments in the field. Now, why not address the biology of the disease? We have the chemotherapeutic agents, we have interferon, but they are really not specific uh, for what we know about the biology of the disease. And we all agree, and this is now common knowledge, that uh, the hyperactive JAKSTAT uh, intercellular signaling pathway is the commonality in all the patients with uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms. And uh, the sense would be that this would be obviously the target for therapy. However, we in the meantime also learn about many other issues uh, with the different mutations in MPNs, particularly mutations that are down here in this cartoon in the epigenetic control of the genetic expression. And this is just one cartoon of the one of the excellent uh, uh, review articles from Dr. Vanuki that tried to explain that there appears to be a role for uh, perhaps uh, uh, medications that would alter the abnormalities that we see in the malopriorative neoplasms, including polycythemia vera, that are related to the epigenetic control and not just to hyperactive intercellular signaling pathway. These are two aspects of the biology of the disease that we know about. And indeed, the first trials in PV were in uh, area of high uh, histone deacetylase inhibitors. Histone deacetylase inhibitors are intimately involved with the histone regulation of epigenetic control, where the JAK uh, protein translates into the nucleus. And the question was, in preclinical models, and that's just one example, whether there is a role for histone deacetylase inhibitors uh, in the control of the proliferation of the cells that are driven by this hyperactive JAK state pathway. That exactly is the case. So in fact, there were studies first in PV with the histone deacetylase inhibitors before the JAK2 inhibitor studies were ever published. And this is just a summary because the studies did show some activity, is, which is outlined here, in ETNPV patients. But unfortunately, the histone deacetylase inhibitors are not easy to take. For example, the median treatment duration in this first study with the Givinostat was only 20 weeks. There are toxicities that preclude long-term efficacy. And we talked uh, earlier on in, in uh, PV uh, session uh, that for one to uh, implement a good therapy for PV, it needs to be obviously effective, but it needs to be tolerated very well for patients to take it for a decades if necessary. More recently, Givinostat was combined with hydroxyurea in patients that did not have a good response to hydria. And there, again, was activity. That's the second bullet on this slide. But again, the toxicity prevents long-term delivery. And the case in point to the toxicity part on part of the histone deceptors inhibitors was the study that was presented at uh, EHA last year and then published using Warinostat where almost all the patients had toxicity and the study had to be abruptly stopped. And therefore, our interest shifted to, indeed, the JAK inhibitors. There was a study with the CEP701 already mentioned earlier on by Dr. Elizabeth Hexner, where there was no good enough activity and some gastrointestinal toxicity with the CEP701. But in the meantime, we also tested in a very small pilot study mentioned by Dr. Ruben Mason earlier on a ruxolitinib, now approved for malofibrosis, in patients with advanced PV. Now, this study was done many years ago, and uh, the eligibility criteria was a uh, little bit loose on part of what is refractory or intolerant patients to hydroxyurea at that time, because um, it was judgment call, basically, by the doctor. In fact, this type of studies led to a development of guidelines for further future studies, uh, what would be, by definition, of the experts, the intolerance or uh, toxicity of hydria for inclusion in the study. So this was only a pilot study in a small number of patients. This is how it was done. Uh, and this is where we are with this study at the moment. There were 34 patients. It was done in Europe and United States. Uh, these were patients with advanced features. They had a high white cell count high platelets, splenomegaly in majority of the patients, they needed phlebotomies, and you see how long they had the disease from the diagnosis. So whether they had fulfilled the criteria for hydria intolerance or resistance, 
um, is a question, but their characteristics clinically are certainly uh, significant. After three years, eight patients discontinued for different reasons. We are not able to prevent progression of the disease, which would be one of the goals that uh, Dr. Odenike mentioned of the therapy. But we did have a number of uh, successes in the other aspects of therapy. Some patients had to uh, discontinue for adverse events unrelated to the study drug, and only one patient did not actually respond. So where do we stand with, with the um, efficacy? This uh, therapy was rather uh, effective in a short uh, course of, uh, within a month, basically. Everybody has normalized hematocrit. Uh, and uh, using the criteria that were explained, complete response and partial response, which is outlined at the bottom, majority of the patients have responded 97% response rate in uh, 34 patients, with complete response see seen in 59. That means normalization of the platelets, vital spleen, and symptoms. And it was actually a surprise that uh, the FDA allowed the performance already of the phase three study based only on 34 patients in PV for possible approval of these medications as a second line therapy in PV. And this is a response study. This is, uh, these are the slides from recent presentations at ASCO, hasn't been published yet. This study utilized that stringent uh, criteria for a resistance or intolerance to hydria, and I can tell you it took some time for accrual because who pushes the dose of hydria, like Dr. Ruben Mesa explained, to two grams. It was done all over the globe and took some time. Uh, these patients definitely were uh, uh, polycythemia vera patients in need of phlebotomy, so we tried to exclude any notion of patients already transforming or transformed to malofibrosis. But they did need to have a spleen enlargement because the goal of the therapy was two part, to eliminate phlebotomy need and to decrease the spleen at the same time. In the first month, the patients uh, were just observed and phlebotomized to have some kind of uniformity at the beginning, and then randomized between ruxolitinib and best available therapy, which were anything basically the doctor wanted to do, including hydroxyurea continuation or nothing. And I'll go in detail in that uh, in the next slide. For first 32 weeks, there was no crossover allowed. Patients basically needed to stick with what they um, were uh, prescribed, although patients on best available therapy were able to choose uh, some other best available therapy. Uh, those of ruxolitin was uh, adjusted based on a toxicity or a need for increase in lack of uh, efficacy. And then uh, the crossover was allowed later on between week 32 and 48. And you will see that almost everybody um, Ninety-five percent of the patients crossed over. So the analysis was done once. Everybody was followed for at least 48 weeks, and this was presented recently, and now su uh, submission for publication was just done uh, a few weeks ago. The patient's characteristics, not to go into detail, but these are patients of um, usual age, 60s. Majority were male, and uh, resistance or intolerance was ju judged, uh, but equally distributed between the two arm. Almost everybody jacked to positive, and a number of them had thromboembolic events. In fact, there was a little bit more of the patients. There are no p-values here, however, yet. That was not analyzed yet. 35% versus 29, whether this is significantly different or not. On the other hand, there was a little bit more of a white cell elevation here on the best available therapy arm, and they needed more phlebotomy in prior 24 weeks before inclusion of the study, whether these are clinically relevant or statistically significant, it's not known yet. The best available therapy included hydria in 60% of the patients. And one would say this is really not good. We are not comparing to a, a second line therapy, which would be perhaps interferon. Or interferon was a choice and it was given to some patients as outlined, 12%, or alternative other therapeutic options. But I think this reflects just the problem that we do have that there is no alternative therapy that people prescribe. So this is where we are. 48 weeks analysis when everybody reached that point. Uh, during the first 32 weeks, uh, people stayed on a therapy. A few st uh, stopped the therapy and the reasons are outlined here. There was no clear difference in the reasons. The toxicity with ruxolitinib was not evident between the two arms as a distinction between them uh, for reasons of uh, stopping the therapy. 
And then the crossover when it was allowed after 32 weeks resulted in almost all the other patients on best available therapy arm to cross to ruxolitinib because they did not achieve the endpoints of the, of the therapy. Or there were other reasons that were specified in the protocol itself. So median exposure at time of analysis quite uh, differ between the two arms for 81 weeks on ruxolitinib and 34 weeks in best available therapy arm. So these are the results. Primary response at week 32, that was the goal, to see the, the result. And the result was a combination of two factors. One was hematocrit control, elimination of lobotomy with hematocrit control, and the other was decreased by 35% in volume of the spleen, which by uh, common uh, knowledge is about 50% reduction in the spleen size. What is important to understand that hematocrit control was very tightly described. If the patient did not show up for the blood check, that was a, a known responder because there was no documentation of a blood count. Or it, if it was out of the window, patient came two days later, that was no responder because he did not do it on a specific uh, time point. So it was very important to follow up the FDA rules. Uh, so these are the results based on this stringent criteria. Overall, together, as a primary endpoint, so this is co-primary endpoint between the two factors, there was a difference, 21% versus 1%. In terms of durability, 91% of patients who achieved the response maintained it later at week 48, which reflects what I have shown before in a phase two study it is uh, durable over time. And this is shown here. Only one patient actually uh, lost a response uh, during the follow-up. The follow-up is rather short. These are first uh, results, uh, just uh, the first analysis for the purpose of submission uh, to uh, publication and to regulatory bodies. Obviously, at the further meetings, we'll have a further analysis uh, and uh, further follow-up. Now, the phlebotomy rate is different from hematocrit control because if the patient had a 45.1%, that was a loss of response or no response, but the doctor had a say. It was not black and white. The doctors had a say in the study. And the doctor said, 45.1, I don't want to phlebotomize you, and the next measurement was 44.5. Then the patient was fine and there was no phlebotomy. That patient on the paper was no responder, but then we actually asked the questions, what was the phlebotomy rate on the study based also on the input of the treating physician? Because the analysis was first done by the numbers as regulatory bodies required. The second analysis was done on actual performance of the procedure as judged by the doctor. And here we have a difference between 62% and 20% between the ruxolitinib and best available therapy, particularly the difference is seen in a need of three or more phlebotomy on the left side of the panel. This is the result in a spleen volume reduction, which is expected from the prior experience in myelofibrosis. Again, 35% volumetric reduction is about 50% by palpation. And then complete hematological remission is normalization of all the counts together, white cells, platelets, and uh, hematocrit where the difference, again, was shown between the two. Acknowledging all these stringent uh, requirements for all the blood work to be done on certain time points and no variations above normal by any, by any uh, decimal. And then the symptoms. A lot of uh, improvements in the symptoms as seen here. This is rather detailed analysis of, uh, of symptoms uh, over 32 weeks using maloproliferative disease uh, symptom assessment form. Uh, which is a very valuable tool. Unfortunately, we don't use it in every practice yet, uh, but uh, we are coming down to uh, perhaps utilizing it. It's only 10 questions, the most recent uh, uh, version. Here we have uh, some of the symptoms uh, highlighted. Here you have itching, 94% uh, improvements, night sweating, uh, quite impressive improvements in the symptomatology, but that is expected to the extent because that was seen previously in myelofibrosis. Thromboembolic events, they were only collected as information. They were not really a primary or secondary endpoint. 
but it is important to follow because ultimately we would like to see that particular change uh, seen uh, between the two groups if possible. Now everybody's crossed over from best available therapy to uh, ruxolitinib uh, after 32 weeks. I'm not sure that we will see much of a difference than what is on this particular table. So we have a, a difference first, of course, in the follow-up of the patients because many more months passed uh, while patients were on ruxolitinib than best available therapy. But we have here six events on best available therapy arm during the first 32 weeks and one on the ruxolitinib arm. No p-values here. This is observation. Further analysis will be done, but uh, for now it's just information sharing. Um, with the notion that high proportion of patients on ruxolitinib arm had a history of thromboembolic events at base and then in best available therapy arm, as I highlighted before. And then in further follow-up of patients on ruxolitinib, because there were no further follow-up on best available therapy arm, they all crossed over, there was one additional event in ruxolitinib. So it's intriguing information, nothing really to conclude out of it, but uh, uh, it follows the notion that control of the blood cell count, including red blood cell count and the white cell count that we ex extensively discussed, appears to have some influence on the thrombotic risk without this being statistically analyzed or the power of the study was not to look at this partic in particular. What about the toxicities? Now, obviously, it's a JAK-STAT inhibitor. It does inhibit the blood production. We chose to start with the 10 milligrams twice a day, a moderate dose. And there were some anemias and uh, low platelets and uh, occasional uh, neutro, uh, neutropenia. But with those adjustments, no single patient was taken off the study. Basically, during the first three months, like with the myelofibrosis, a little bit more of a follow-up is necessary, perhaps over two weeks, to adjust the dose and find the best dose for a particular patient. And there is no need to interrupt or stop the therapy with the JAK inhibitor. Non-hematological side effects. Again, open-label study within ruxolitinib based available therapy. Headaches appear to be similar. These are low grades. Uh, diarrhea, a little bit more, uh, doubling uh, from 7 to 14 between the two groups. Fatigue, about the same. Pruritis, much more on best available therapy arm because it's better control on, on pruritis, on uh, ruxolitinib. And here, abdominal pain and asthenia, much more prominent on the best available therapy arm. Not much of a grade 3 or 4 toxicities. The similar experience that we've seen in the mild fibrosis part. Uh, previously in a COMFORT-1 and COMFORT-2 studies. So it appears to be safe, uh, effective, and long-term. Uh, we are satisfied with the patients staying on the, on the therapy. We'll see how long they're going to be on therapy and what will be the uh, thrombotic uh, 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 rate of uh, thrombotic events. So in conclusion, we do see that this therapy appears to be uh, a therapy that is valuable for patients that have inadequate response or toxicity to hydroxyurea. So specifically what uh, Ruben mentioned before, a second-line therapy, uh, because it does uh, control different aspects of the disease, the counts, the spleen, the symptoms. Uh, I can't really say about the traumatic risk. It is just an uh, observation. This uh, therapy uh, appears to be effective on a long term, and uh, I would say that uh, the submission to regulatory bodies for possible approval of this medication has already been made, and we are waiting to see what will happen over the next six months. I thank you very much for your attention.